I shouldn't be here. Cecilia or Eliza could have been swaying on this stinking vessel instead of me. It was their right, Eliza's duty anyway as the eldest daughter, to make the voyage and take the chance on a new land. But mum and dad offered a litany of excuses for my sisters. The twenty-one-year-old Eliza was on the brink of a marriage that would allow the family to keep our farm tenancy intact, a status that had eluded me due to my over-cleverness, Dad said, and Cecilia was too young for the voyage at fifteen, and too weak-spirited in any event. And so, knowing my parents were right, I boarded the envoy in their place. Forty-two days later, I regretted the preening and arrogance to which I subjected my sisters when I'd learned of my parents' decision. I knew now that being considered my parents' Schiffer, their changeling capable of transmuting into whatever America required, was no prize, and I desperately missed my sisters. Light snuck through the hatch into the steerage cabin, blinding me for a moment. My eyes closed spontaneously. Even as the light faded a bit, I chose to keep my eyes shut, surrendering to the remnants of the sun's heat. I wanted the fading rays to burn me clean. I wanted them to burn away the sour smell of the long Atlantic passage and the recurrent tears of leave-taking. The steward clanged the ship's bell to signal our disembarking. I opened my eyes and reluctantly glanced around the cabin. Mothers with listless infants in their arms pushed themselves to standing, while their older, hollow-eyed children clung to their skirts, scared by the relentless ringing of the bell. Fathers and old men struggled to smooth their filthy, rumpled suits into some sad approximation of dignity. Only the few young men, the fear Oga, were strong enough, and eager enough, to readily form a queue. The journey had been rough, taking its toll on even the fear Oga. Nearly three weeks prior, after an already tumultuous crossing, a storm hit the envoy, tumbling those of us in steerage out of our beds into a hold with two feet of water. As the crew and my fellow passengers began working the pump in the pitch dark of the moonless night, the ship began rolling from side to side like the heavy log it was, causing one Dublin girl of about sixteen, travelling alone like myself, to crash into one of the wooden posts keeping the ceiling firm above our heads. Moaning as she fell with a splash onto the still-flooded floor, she never regained consciousness. When she died the next morning, the captain sent the first mate and a sailor to steerage to sew her up in a sheet with some rocks at her feet to weigh her down and throw her overboard without a single word or prayer. This loss and her treatment bore heavily upon me, upon all of us, really, as it seemed a portent of the treatment we might expect in the new land. Footsteps clapped on the wooden deck above our heads, followed by the thud and drag of trunks. My cabin mates rushed to assemble their meager belongings, rucksacks, wicker baskets, tools, treasured pictures and Bibles, even the odd battered trunk. But I knew we needn't hurry. We would bide our time until all the other classes had left the ship. Steerage always waited. For the dry biscuits, putrid water, and rancid oatmeal that serve as sustenance. For sleep uninterrupted by hacking coughs and crying babies. For air uncontaminated with the stink of vomit and full chamber pots. For storms to break and the hatch to be unlocked, to grant us a few blissful moments above deck. For privacy that never came. I was tired of waiting, but we had no choice but to stand in the queue immobile but for the rocking of the ship in the harbour. I glanced at the young mother beside me, her tattered brown dress stained with the evidence of her baby's constant seasickness. At seventeen or so, she was a couple of years younger than my nineteen years, but her eyes looked older. There, lines had given way to furrows. All alone throughout this terrible voyage, she bore the weight not only of her own worries and suffering, but also those of her child. I felt ashamed at wallowing in my own discomfort and longing for home. Ah, more, I said, having nothing to offer her and her baby but luck. 
No worries here that we'd receive tallies on our BATA score for speaking Irish instead of English, and then receive the corresponding punishment, as teachers at the hedge schools for the Irish were instructed to do. Not that this poor mother had ever been beaten for speaking Irish in school, as it wasn't likely that she'd attended school of any sort. She looked surprised at my words. I'd maintained my distance from fellow passengers, at Mum's request, and this young mother and I had never spoken. This separation kept me healthy, if unpopular, among my gregarious countrymen, who resented my standoffishness. Too weary to speak, she nodded her thanks.